as a data engineer, you are very likely to work within a cloud environment. Obviously, it will probably not be your choice which cloud to use since this is a strategic decision that is probably taken by the chief technology officer of your company. However, in this course, we are going to use Google Cloud since Go is a first-class citizen on that cloud. Also, I think it is a good cloud with good services. First, we need to create an account on Google Cloud. Notice that generally the cloud costs money. You will have to enter your credit card information if you want to use it. However, as a new user, you get free credits for a limited amount of time. Even if you're not eligible for free credits, I will use services that offer a free tier by which some monthly usage will not incur costs. Nevertheless, be prepared to pay for the usage of Google Cloud. Obviously, you do this on your own risk and I cannot take responsibility for any costs that occur from running the code. As a first step, we need to navigate to Google Cloud and create an account. Go to cloud.google.com. In here, you can just click on get started for free and create a Google account. If you already have a Google account, you can just use that one. So notice that I already have a Google account, plus I'm already enrolled on Google Cloud. Hence, I cannot show you those steps. However, it's pretty easy to do. Go ahead and enroll in Google Cloud. Once you have done that, you will probably be on the landing page of your cloud instance. If you haven't already, the first step is to create a new project. I'm going to create one called Go for Data Engineers. So let me go here. Then up here, you can create a project. I'm going to create one called Go for Data Engineers. And now I can switch the project. And I'm going to the project that I just created. Next, we want to create some services that we are going to use. For the example in the video, we only need a cloud storage solution. So let's set up the storage solution. Make sure that you are in the correct project and then click on the hamburger icon on the top left. You can just click on products and solutions and then on all products. This will show you all the available services on Google Cloud. Notice that you can bookmark them by clicking on this pin icon. Well, we want to use Google Cloud Storage. Hence, click on the storage category and then click on Cloud Storage. So storage, oh, it's right there, and then cloud storage. We want to create a storage bucket. So click on create for this. First, pick a name. Notice that the name has to be globally unique. I'm just picking go for data engineers storage. Bit of a mouthful, but that should be available. So I'm going to call this one go for data engineers storage. Click continue. Next, we need to select where our storage should be located at. For our example, it is fine to just choose a single data center. So I'll click on region and I think I take the one in Iowa. Notice that for a production setting, you might want to choose multiple region and you definitely want to make sure to co-locate your services in the same data center. Also make sure to comply with data protection regulations that apply in your country. So we pick single region and I just choose US Central 1 Iowa. If, you, if you're doing that, you can of course choose diff a different region. Just notice that not all of the regions support the free tier. So if you pick Iowa, that's, that's a good choice. Click continue. So next we need to specify our storage class. Most cloud providers offer different storage types for whatever access pattern you expect. And we can just pick the standard one. Next, we need to define access restrictions for our storage class. Obviously, in a production setting, you will want to make sure that your storage is locked down and only people or services that you want can access this. I'm not going to create fine-grained access control based on the different assets in the bucket. Hence, I leave it as it is. Obviously, we also want to enforce no public access for a bucket. Also, we don't want any data protection since this is just an example. We also find with Google managing our data encryption. Great, so next on, let's create that bucket. We now have our very first Google Cloud service that we can interact with in Go. And this is exactly what we are going to do next. 
For our example, I choose the Edgar database of the SEC. If you don't know what this database contains, it has all of the financial filings of SEC regulated corporations. This is a pretty large database containing vast amount of information. What I like most about this is that they also offer condensed company facts. All the historically available information from the fillings organized by Account Schema can be accessed via a single API call. The API is free, up to date, and you don't even have to sign up for some API key or whatever. The only requirement, you need to identify who you are and don't overdo it with concurrency. The API is pretty well organized. Every company listed with the SEC has a CIK number. That is a unique number which can identify a single corporation. For example, if we want to find the CIK number for Goldman Sachs, we can just Google for Goldman Sachs CIK. So for example, we can say Goldman Sachs CIK. So if I click on this and just look at the URL, that it seems that the CIK number for Goldman Sachs is 00008869821. We can now use that CIK number and get the company facts for the company registered under that CIK number. So let me just copy that one. And you can access the API via HTTPS forward slash data.scc.gov forward slash API forward slash XBRL forward slash company facts forward slash CIK, then whatever the CIK number is, dot JSON. That yields a JSON with a whole bunch of information organized by accounting framework. Let's assume that we have a list of CIK numbers that are of interest to us, and we want to get that JSON into our Google Cloud storage. We're not going to do anything with that data yet. We are merely going to load the company facts for a given CIK number and save the raw JSON in our storage account or in our storage bucket. This problem will teach us how to make HTTP requests and upload data to Google Cloud Storage via Go. Let's get started with that. So fire up your favorite editor or IDE and create a new Go project. I'm going to call this project Edgar Facts. So I'm going to say fkdir Edgar Facts see into it. And to initialize the project, I'm going to say go mod. I'm going to use my GitHub handle, github.com forward slash jh. And the name of the project, Edgar Facts. Uh, go mod in it, of course. We want a command and internal folder just like we did before. So I'm going to create a folder called command. And I'm going to create one more code internal. All right, let's start by creating a function that takes a CIK number as input and returns the corresponding JSON. If the data does not exist, it should return an error. Recreate that function inside an internal package. One special thing, while the SEC is pretty relaxed when it comes to using the API, they want you to set some custom user agent in your request header. The user agent should contain your name, organization, and email. The name, organization, and email should be provided by the user when invoking the function. So let me open new vim, and I'm gonna create a package in internal. I'm gonna call that one facts, and it's in facts.go. So as always, I'm gonna declare my package, and I'm gonna call that one facts, I'm going to do some imports. And I know that I need the format package because I want to just print that to the screen. I want to handle some data. So I'm going to use the IO utilities from the IO package. Errors, because I want to create an error. Net HTTP. Then I'm going to define my function, load company company facts. So that function is the one we just talked about. So we call this one load facts. Remember, it should take a CIK number, a name, an organization, and an email as input. And it should return a slice of bytes and an error. Possibly an error, could be no. 
or we hope it will be null. So the first thing that we want to do is define the URL for the API. And the URL will be, well, we already looked at this. So I'm going to format a string here. It's HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash data dot SEC dot gov forward slash API forward slash XBRL forward slash company facts CIK then a string dot JSON and the string will just be the CIK number. Great, let's create a client for our HTTP request. So we take the and create a pointer to an HTTP client, which we're going to invoke. Let's prepare the request that we want to make. So the request will be a GET request. So we say new request. Well, the type will be GET. The URL will be, well, the URL that we defined before. We're not going to send any data with it. And if it cannot create that request, well, we want to return nothing for the bytes and the error. Let's set the custom user agent. So the user agent is going to be Notice that it's not print line. We're going to format a string and save it to user agent, the same as we did for the URL. So it's going to be a string, a space, string, a space, and another string. And in there, we put the organization first. Organization, then the name of the user, then the email. Then we set the header for our or the user agent in the header for our request so the user agent is going to be that string then we make the request which will yield a response and maybe an error so the client should do this request if there is an error well, return nothing for the bytes and return the error. Since this is a stream of data, I want to make sure that I close the connection. And then I'm going to check the response code of the crest or of the response, sorry. So if the response code or the status code of our response is not good, so it's not okay. Well, I want to create a custom error. I'm just going to call this one error status. So this should be a new error, so we're going to create our own error here. And the error message should be Status code is not 200 or not okay. Let's let's do it like that. And then whatever is the natural representation for the status code that we get. Then we're going to return nothing for the bytes, and we're going to return that error that we just created. So let me get some space in here. Then we're going to read the response body. So now it's time to look at the content of the response. So we want to take, let's use the IO util sub package and we're gonna read all the data from the response body. If there's an error while doing that, well, you can guess what we're doing. We return nothing for the data and we return the error. Then return the final response, which would be 
the body or the bytes, the response, and nothing for the error. So let me just check. Let me just save that to see that whether up oh, there seems to be an error. Then 41. No, it doesn't seem to like. I put this onto multiple lines. No problem. Are you happy now? Yeah, it's happy. So that is a pretty big function. And as always, let's digest this one by one. So let's have a look at the imports first. So you can see we are importing a few new packages here. More specifically, I am importing HTTP from the built-in net package. And that package is used to communicate over networks. It supports many protocols and one of them is HTTP, which is used to make HTTP requests. Also, I am importing the IO util sub package from the IO package and the errors package. All of them are built in. Next, we start by defining our function that auto retrieve the raw bytes of the company facts. You can see in the function signature that it takes a CIK number. However, it also takes a username, organization, and email, which is needed inside the user agent header. Notice how I only added the string type declaration to the very last argument. If all the preceding arguments have the same type, you can do it like that. Next, we declare that the function returns two things, a slice of bytes and an error. As we have covered in the video on functions, this is a pretty common way of designing functions. It returns the actual result and an error. If the function runs through without issues, the error will be nil. If there are issues, the error won't be nil. Hence, we cascade the error to the user, calling this function, and leave the user to handle that error. Next, we go ahead and define the relevant URL that contains the company facts for the CIK number we have received. For this, I use the sprintf function inside the format package. The sprintf function creates a string using string formatting. You can see that the base URL is https forward slash data.scc.gov forward slash API XBRL company facts CIK and whatever the CIK number is dot JSON. So the string, also the percentage sign S, will be filled with whatever CIK number we have gotten from the function caller. Notice that the CIK number has to be a string, not an integer. Many of those CIK numbers have leading zeros that need to be preserved. Hence, we handle those as strings and not and not as integers. Afterwards, we create an HTTP client that will do the requests for us. Notice the way this is done by invoking the client struct inside the HTTP package that we imported before. However, we will need a pointer to such a client in the remaining code. So this part of the code is pretty interesting. We create an instance of the struct, so the HTTP client, and then immediately create a pointer to it without even saving the client, so the actual client, somewhere. And this might seem a bit counterintuitive to you. How can you create a pointer to something that isn't even bound to a variable? Well, just because it is not bound to a variable doesn't mean it does not exist. There is a client created in the runtime. It is just not exposed as a variable. We decided that the only reference to that client in our code will be a pointer. Using that pointer, you can use the client. All of this can be done by just putting an ampersand in front of the invocation of the struct. The request that we actually want to make is still missing. Hence, we do that by using the new request function from the HTTP sub package. This takes the type of request you would like to do, a URL, and the request body. Since we don't want to attach any data to our request, we just use nil for that. This function will return a request and an error. Notice how we handle potential errors. If the error that is returned from the function is not nil, we immediately return the function by returning nothing for the bytes and cascading the error to the user. Next, we need to define our user agent for making our GET request. The way the SEC wants us to do that is by putting the name of the organization first, then the name of the person responsible running the code, and that person's email. For that, I just use the sprintf function once more and put the strings where they belong. Then I access the header data field of the request and use the set method to set the user agent attribute to the string we have just defined previously. So after all this work, it is now time to actually make the get request and receive some response. For this, we use the pointer to the client and use the do method. It merely takes a predefined request, which we have created using the new request function. This returns a response and a possible error. Again, we merely cascade the error if it is not nil. Notice the call 
below handling the error. Ignore the defer part for now. I am closing the connection to the server sending us the response. The response body represents a stream of data from the server that we have connected to. Obviously, you would like to be a good citizen and clean up your resources once it is done. Using the defer statement, we can defer the actual invocation of that method call. The connection will only be closed once it isn't used in your code any longer. This is kind of like what the with statement in Python does when you open a file. While the actual request might technically be successful, it doesn't say anything about the content that gets returned. Hence, we need to check for the status code that we have gotten back after making that request. For this, we access the status code data field inside the response we got back. You might already know quite a few status codes. A success doesn't have to be a 200, could also be a 201. Hence, we can check if the status code represents any of the successes. Here we do the inverse and just check whether it is not any of these success status codes by comparing it to the status OK struct in the HTTP sub package. If the source code does not represent a success, we do the following. Create a string saying status code is not okay, and then whatever the status code is, and the string is used as an input in a new error. We then return nothing for the bytes and return the error where the end user would expect an error. If the status code indicates a success, we need to get the actual bytes that are returned by the API. For this, we use the read all function from the IOUtil sub package. This will help us get the response body as bytes. Once we have the response, we merely return the bytes and nil for the error. And that is the entire function. You might say that this seems overly complex for making a simple GET request. Well, you would be right. If you just want to do plain vanilla GET requests, you could also just use HTTP.GET and put the URL in as the sole argument. This would return a response, which you would then handle. No clients, no request creation, etc. Notice, however, that we needed to set the headers, hence the more labor-intensive route. Great, that was quite a bit, and we now need to put that function to some use. Let's create an application inside the command folder for this. I'm going to call this facts as well. So let's save this. Then inside the command folder, we add facts, facts.go. In here, we add the usual stuff and the internal package that we have just created. At this point, I just want to print the raw text to the screen. For our example, I will use the CIK number for Goldman Sachs and just see what the API returns. Notice that I will use my personal information for the user agent. You will have to enter your own personal information, so please make sure to comply with rules laid out by the SEC. So, you the package, and I'm gonna call this main some imports well I want to print something to the screen obviously you need the format package and then I'm going to import my internal package so github.com github handle Edgar my project Edgar facts internal facts I'm going to declare a main function So we're going to load the company facts for Goldman Sachs. So the CIK number for Goldman Sachs, by the way, I looked this up before. 00088869A2. Organization. name, email, I'm going to fill this on later. Just put your personal organization name and email in. And then I'm going to say facts, error. So I'm going to use the facts function, uh, sorry, the load facts function from the facts package. And then we're going to put in the CIK number the organization, name, and the email. Now, if there's an error, I'm going to panic. Else, we're just going to print this to the screen. 
since we already included all of the logic inside the function, there is not a lot left to do. I merely enter my personal information and make the function call. If the function returns an error, I let the program panic, which will print the error stack to the screen. If it succeeds, I convert the raw bytes to a string and print that to the screen. In the end, I expect a large JSON string to be printed to the screen. So let's take this for a test drive and see if it works. So one thing I'm gonna do off camera is I'm gonna fill out this personal information, organization, name, and email. Make sure that you do that yourself. So let's run this, run, go, run, command, facts, facts, set, go. Although this is just some messy JSON string on the screen, it is the result that we were hoping for. Since this data is pretty much accumulating, it makes sense to simply overwrite the file when we upload it to Google Storage. Also, I think it makes sense to save the CIK number as the file name. This way, we can build a hierarchical structure when we stage the data to the storage location. In order to interact with Google Storage programmatically from Go, we first need to install the official client. Go to your command line and then make sure that you are in the project folder and enter the following. Go get. So, go get cloud.google.com forward slash go forward slash storage. Now you will be able to use this package in your project. Also, if you now check the go.mod file in your project, you will see that there is now a list of project dependencies. So let's check that. Next, we need to make sure that we can access the Google Cloud Storage. Obviously, there is the need to authenticate. If we would run the code in the Google Cloud, it would be pretty easy. But at this point of the course, I wanna run the code on my computer. In the next video, we will move our code into the cloud. The way that Google Cloud manages authentication for local development is that you can download account credentials, which is just a JSON file. You can move that file to some default location, or actually it will be written there for you, and whenever you interact with Google services, it will try to find the authentication file in such a default location. No manual inputs of secrets or whatever. I really like this approach. Anyways, to get such credentials, we need to install the Google Cloud CLI. I will use that CLI to download the credentials for my Google account. So let's download the Google Cloud CLI. So I'm gonna just Google for install Google Cloud CLI. And I'm just gonna click on the first link here. And since I'm on a Linux system, I'll choose Linux as a system. And also I am on a 64-bit machine. So let's copy the link to the tar.gzip file and download that. So let's take that one and then copy the link. So let me just switch into my downloads folder. And then let me download that file. Right, and so next we unpack that file. I'm gonna use the tar utility for that. Cool, next on we install that file. So let's just, oh, actually let me, let me ls. And that there is a file called install.sh. So I'm gonna run that file. Uh, I'm gonna say yes, that's fine. So I already have the CLI installed on my machine, but you can just go through this installer. So I'm just gonna, I'm not, I'm not gonna reinstall it, but you can, so you can just press Y. And you might've noticed that I'm running Debian on a Windows subsystem for Linux, which is basically a Linux VM within Windows. The thing is that it does not come with a GUI. However, to log in and download the user credentials, it needs to be able to spawn a browser so we can use the Google login page. A workaround for a situation like that is to use the no browser option. This will yield a link that you can use on a machine that you trust, which also has the Google Cloud CLI installed. From there, the, then you can log in. So what I'm going to do is, I'm gonna say gcloud auth application dash default login. However, I'm also going to use the no dash browser option. If you're running a Linux distribution with a GUI or any other operating system with a GUI, you can leave the dash no browser option and simply follow the instructions. That will be much easier. 
If you don't, install the Google Cloud CLI on a trusted machine with a GUI and just add the no browser option like I did. So, so let's hit enter. So you can see that it says, you are authorizing client libraries without access to a web browser. Please run the following command on a machine with a web browser and copy its output back here. Make sure the install gcloud version is da -da 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 on your. So we're going to copy this command. So again, we are in the Linux machine or on the Linux machine. I'm copying this. Now I'm opening a new shell. I'm opening a command prompt on Windows. So I'm now on my Windows computer. I'm pasting this and hit enter. So it's asking us whether we want to proceed. Yes, I do trust this computer. So I say, and a web browser opens. I log in. Yes, I agree. And there you go. Now let's go back into our terminal. So it says, copy the following line back to the gcloud CLI, waiting to continue the login flow. Warning, the following line enables access to your Google Cloud resources. Only copy it to the trusted machine that you ran the gcloud, blah, 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 and so on command on earlier. So we copy this, go back into our Linux terminal, and it says enter the output of the above command, which was the stuff we just copied. So let's put that in there and hit enter. Great, it's done. So it says credentials, save to file, well, the home folder, my home folder, dot config, gcloud, application default credentials, dot json. So every time we use a Google service from our computer, it's going to look for the credentials inside that location. So that was quite a bit, but I think getting access to stuff is always the task that is associated with the most ha hassle. Now that we got that out of the way, we can start looking at the code to interact with Google Cloud. Just know that we have the credentials associated with our account in the right place. And as long as we have access to the actual resource we interact with, Go will know how to gain access. So I'm going to create a storage sub package in our project that I use to interact with Google Storage. So let me open up my editor. By the way, I can close down this and also I don't really need a browser. So let me open up my NeoVim editor. Let's go up. Oh, sorry. Let's make sure we are in the right. So it's develop in my development folder under Edgar facts. All right. And let's get back into NeoVim. And we want to create a new internal package, which should be under storage. I'm going to follow that, call that file storage.go. So first things first, let's declare a package. So package, I'm going to call this one storage. I'm going to make some imports. Actually, the only thing that I'm going to import here is the context package and the Google Cloud package that we already made sure we have access to. So Google cloud.google.com slash go uh, forward slash go. And then storage. Remember that for our example, we want to simply upload a file to a location. The file name is given by the CIK number. If the file already exists, we merely overwrite it. Pretty simple use case. Remember that the data lives in memory. Hence, we expect a slice of bytes to upload. The first thing we do is create a context. Contacts in Go are used to manage cancellation and timeouts of longer running functions. That way, you can add a context to a function, and if the internal countdown reaches zero, it will exit. There are also other use cases for contacts, but that does not need to bother us at this point. So let us define a function. So we're going to say upload bytes. And I'm going to call this one upload bytes as well. Import will be a slice of bytes, a name for bucket, and a path to the file in that bucket and should return an error, or possibly it can return an error. So first let's create a buffer. So we're gonna say buffer equals, oh yeah, I need the bytes package for that one. So it's bytes dot new buffer, buffer, and we take the data input for that one. So we now have a buffer to the byte slice. Then we're gonna create a client. So this will be our storage client, but first I'm gonna need a context for that one. And I'm just gonna use a background context, the most simplest one. So I'm gonna create a client and, and possibly I'll get an error from the creation. So storage, the one that we just imported. So this is the Google Cloud storage client dot 
new client because we want to create a new client. And as input, it takes a context. And I just create this simple background context. So if we have an error, then what we want to do is return that error to the end user. Because remember, our function might return an error. So then I definitely want to close the client at some point. So I'm going to defer that, defer that call. Then I need to create a writer where I can write data to. And for this, I need to change my context a bit. And you will see that we also get a cancellation function back. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to say context, the package that we just imported in order to create context. I'm going to say with timeout because I want to add a timeout to my CTX variable, so which is the context. And the timeout should be well, 120, so two minutes basically that should be enough. And at some point, I might want to cancel this one if the timeout has reached 120 seconds. Now, time to create the writer. Do that by, by using the client. And we create a bucket representation. Well, it's going to be the name of the bucket that we get as input from the function. Then we can an object representation. And the, we need to input the path to that object. And then we want to create a writer for exactly that object. And it needs a context. And we're going to use the context with the 120 second timeout. Let me get some space here. And then we want to copy the data from the buffer to Google Cloud Storage using that writer. So um, it's going to return how many bytes were written. I actually don't care about that. I only care about a potential error. IO, and we can use the copy function from the IO package. Well, destination is the writer, and the source is the buffer. Now, if that operation throws an error, we're going to return that error. Else, I'm going to close that writer. So, writer.close. But if this yields an error, I want to return that error. And then as an end result, I'll just return nil because if the program reached this point, there is not an error. Let me save this. So we take three input arguments, the data we want to upload, the name of the bucket, and the path to that file. The function potentially returns an error. And the way I implement the function is that if everything goes well, it merely returns nil. So first I create a buffer so I can easily write that data from the byte string. Then I create a context. The background context is good if you don't really want to implement any timeouts. Afterwards, I create a client to interact with Google Cloud Storage. The new client function returns a client and an error. Obviously, there are many sources of error here. For example, maybe for some reason we are not able to authenticate, etc. This would be represented in the error. As always, I check whether or not the error is null. If it is not nil, I cascade the error to the caller of the function. Lastly, I decide that I want to close the client once it is no longer in use. Afterwards, I create a writer that I can use to write data into the storage. For this, I first add a 100 second timeout to the context we already created since I want one for the upload. Using the defer keyword again, we declare that the operations this context uh, is attached to should cancel after 120 seconds. We can achieve this because the with timeout function returns a context that we can pass into other functions if needed and a callable cancel function. Now remember that there is a hierarchy. Objects live in buckets. The bucket can be accessed using our Google storage client. Hence, I referenced the bucket from the client and the object from that bucket. In the end, I create a writer for that object. Writing data to and reading from data sources in Go is pretty easy if the sync and source implement the writer and reader interfaces. We haven't covered interfaces, but you can imagine them as blueprints for certain methods that your structs might implement. If they implement the reader and writer interfaces, they can be used inside the I.O. package to move data around very easily. And one of such utilities is the I.O. copy function, which takes some destination and a source. They need to implement the writer and reader interfaces, respectively. Our writer variable implements the writer interface and our buffer implements the reader interface. Hence, we're good. And now you can see why I created a new buffer at the very beginning.
In the end, I just close the writer and return nil as an error since there was no error when the function reaches that point. So let's take that function for a test drive. However, for this, we need to expand our application file and simply upload the bytes that we received after making the API call. So let me just save this. Let's go back into our command file and let's make some changes here. So the first thing that I want to import is the function that I just defined. So github.com, so my github handle, Edgar facts, journal, and the package name was storage. So let me just get rid of this so I can unblur this. All right, so we have the CK organization name, email, and we load the facts. We panic if that throws an error. So we don't want to print stuff to the screen, but we want to upload that to the storage account. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a bucket name here. And remember the bucket name was go for, go for data engineers storage. There's not a spelling mistake in there. So the file path where I want to save this to, well, this is going to be, I'm going to format a string here. I'm going to say, should be in the SEC folder, then Edgar folder, and then in the effects folder, then in the stage folder. And I'm going to call this thing, well, there's going to be a string.json, and the string will simply be the CIK number that we have received. So let's try to upload this. Actually, it's equal because we already created the error variable. So we're going to say storage dot upload bytes facts bucket name bucket name and the path to the file. Now, if that error is not nil, I want to panic using that error. Else I'm gonna lock, lock the upload. So I'm just gonna print f uploaded colon some string line break and the CIK number. So let's save this. Cool, looks like we are finally at the point where we can upload something to our storage account. Let us now run that program. And for this, I'm going to fill in the blanks for the CIK number, organization, and name and email. And as always, you go ahead and put your details in. And I just noticed that I also blanked out the CIK number, which obviously is public, so I can put that in. Now remember that the CIK number for Goldman Sachs was 00008869822. So I'm gonna fill in the blanks and you do the same. All right, let's run that program. Seems this has worked, so let's navigate into our bucket on Google Cloud and see the content in there. I would expect to have the file underneath SEC, Edgar, Facts, Stage, and then the CIK number.json. So let's have a look at uh, in the Google Cloud folder. So if you don't remember how to get there, you can just you know enter the Google Cloud welcome page, make sure that you are in your project, go to the nav navigation menu, products and solutions, all products, then storage. If you haven't bookmarked it, it's a good idea to bookmark it. Then you click on this one, and there you are. Go for data engineers storage, SEC, Edgar, facts, stage, and there's the file. So let me have a look at that data. Yep, this seems to work. There's only one last thing that I would like to change now. I want to read the CIK username, organization, and email from the command line when the user invokes the function. For this, we can use the flag package. Also, I would like to do proper logging using the built-in package for logging. And I would like to retrieve the name of the bucket and the folder path via environment variables, since I assume this will not be something set by the user, but by the engineer building the service. For interacting with the underlying operating system, we can use the built-in OS package. I will also need the file path sub package from the path package, which is also built in since I want to construct the path for the file from the CIK number and whatever the environment variable for the folder is. So let me open the editor once more. So we go back into the application file and we can already remove the CIK organization name and email variables. The first thing I'm going to do is import some more packages. So I want to lock stuff. I want to pass command line arguments for which I'm going to use the flag package. 
And I want to construct a file path. So I'm going to say path, file path. So let's completely redo the main function. First thing, we want to parse the command line arguments. So I know I'm going to need a CAK number, a variable containing that. So I'm going to call this one CAK. I know that I'm going to need a organization variable, also a string. Same for the name and email. Now I'm going to read those in and, s and set the variable equal to something. So flag.string var, put in the pointer to the relevant variable. So for the CIK, I'm going to create a pointer to the CIK variable. The argument, I will call it CIK. The default value should be, well, an empty string. And the explanation will be CIK number. So same thing for the organization. Organization is going to be the name of the option. Default value will be an empty string. And description will be your organization. And then once more, I'm going to do this for the name. Empty string, your name. And going to do this. Once more for the email. Oops. So the option will be email. The default will be an empty string. Description will be your email. I'm gonna parse those command line arguments. Now I want to validate those command line arguments. So if the length of the CIK variable it's not equal to 10. Well, then I'm simply going to panic because I just can't return that error. So I'm going to say CIK must be of length 10. Then I'm going to check whether organization is an empty string. And if that is the case, I'm going to panic and say, please provide the name of your organization. Let me put some space in here. If the same is the case for name, so I'm going to panic. Say, please provide your name. And if the email is empty, I'm going to say, please provide your email address. Great, so next we're going to load the environment variables. So the bucket name, I'm going to get this from the environment variable bucket for the folder to the uh, path to the folder, I mean, sorry. I'm going to get this from, I'm going to call this one stage. So if the bucket name is an empty string or the folder path is an empty string, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to panic. I'm going to say error reading environment variables. Now i got to configure the logger. So the logger will be log.new because I want a new logger. I want to print my logs to the standard output. Uh, don't need a custom prefix. And I want to set the standard logging flags. Then I'm going to load the data. So actually, let's print this. Print logger.printf. Loading facts for well, a string and a line break. And it's just going to be that CIK number. So let's load this facts dot load facts CIK that we get from the command line organization that we get from the command line name that we get from the command line the email that we get from the command line. And if there's an error, well then I wanna panic using that error. 
then I want to upload to Google Storage. So the file name is the first thing I got to define. Well, I'm just going to create format a string for that one. So it's going to be a string dot JSON, uh, string dot JSON, and I'm just going to use the CIK for that string. And the path should be well. Remember, we get the path to the folder from an environment variable. So I'm going to join two things here to a path, the path of that folder and the name of that file. Then I'm going to lock something one more time. I'm going to say uploading facts to, well, it's going to be a string on bucket, also a string, I break, and we use the file name and the name of our bucket as input. And now we actually got to do the upload. So error storage dot upload bytes. Input will be the facts, which is a slice of bytes, the bucket name, and the file path. Now, if we have an error, well, uh, panic using that error. Obviously, we're not returning anything since we are in the application file. So let's save this. And let's go back all the way to the beginning of the function. We start by declaring and passing the command line arguments. Since I want to use them as normal variables, I start by declaring those variables. You can see that I create one variable, each for the CIK number, your organization, your name, and your email. Afterwards, I use the string var function from the flag package. This way, we bind command line arguments to the variables we just declared. For every command line argument that I would like to parse, I add one entry. The first argument is a pointer to the variable where I would like to save the data in. The second argument is the name of the command line argument. Then we also use the default value. Here, I merely choose an empty string. Since I don't really have optional values, I will check for empty strings when validating the command line arguments. Lastly, I add a short description of that command line argument. Once all of that is in place, it's time to parse the command line arguments from the user input into the variables we have just declared. We do that by using the parse function from the flag package. This doesn't say anything about whether or not the actual user input makes sense. So we need to validate this. It basically follows the same pattern for every command line argument that we have. If it is an empty string, we decide to panic. For the CIK number, I also check whether the length of the input is exactly 10. Next on, environment variables. This is pretty easy to do. Just use the getENV function from the built-in OS package. Again, I merely check whether those are empty strings. I also told you that we will use the official logging utility. For this, I create a new logger that will print the logs to standard output. So this is not a huge difference to what we were doing when we were printing stuff to the screen using the format package. However, I could have also added a custom prefix if I wanted, which I don't, so it's an empty string. Notice that in the end, I added a cryptic call. This will add the standard logging flags to our logger. This way, the logger will add a timestamp to our logs. When loading the facts for our CIK, we already started using that logger. You can see that I use it the same way I was using the format package. I use the printf function to print a formatted string. Then I use the load facts function that we have defined before. Before uploading our data to Google Storage, I create the file path from our environment variable and the CIK number that the user has given. I print this to the screen using our logger. Then finally, I upload the data to Google Storage. So let's remove the old data from Google and try to fetch the Goldman Sachs data once more. However, this time we will use our program the proper way with command line arguments and environment variables. So let's save this. Let's go back into Google Cloud. So we navigate to our storage solution. Let's go into a bucket. And then we select that folder and we delete it. Yes, we want to delete it. Okay, data is deleted. Now there's nothing on that Google Cloud Storage again. Next, let us compile this program that we just wrote. However, let's create a new folder called dist that contains compiled programs. When compiling our program, I will tell Go to use that folder as an output folder using the dash o argument. So let's save this. First, I'm going to create that dist folder. So create a folder called dist. And then I'm going to compile that program in there. So go build dash o for the output 
and the output should go into dist, and that program will be called facts. And the program that should be compiled is in command, facts, facts.go. If you now have a look at the contents of that folder, you can see our small program in there. So let's ls, let's see the content of the dist folder. And there it is, our program. Next, we are going to set these two environment variables and then run the program with the right command line arguments. So first, we're gonna set the environment variables. So first one was bucket. The name of the bucket was go for data engineers storage. Go for data engineers storage, yes. Then we're gonna set the folder for the staging. And that was SEC, Edgar, facts, stage, and now we're gonna run a program. So I'm gonna use the program that was built into the dist folder. So that one was called effects. Then I'm gonna use the CIK command line argument and I'm gonna set this to 0 0 0 0 82 And then I'm gonna enter my personal information, so name, organization and I'm gonna set email and then we run the program the stuff that we wanted to lock gets printed to the screen and we get the confirmation that it has run successfully finally let us now have a look at the data that is on our Google Cloud storage bucket so let's open the bucket again Let's refresh. So we have the folder SEC, Edgar, facts, stage, and there's the JSON file. Fantastic, that worked great. Now let's do one more example where we get the company facts for BlackRock. So I'm just gonna get that command again. Okay, so the CIK for BlackRock would be 000, one, three, six, four, seven, four, two. Another round done successfully. So let's look at the data on our Google Cloud Storage again. Let's refresh, and there's the data. You can see that it is now super easy for us to load company facts from SEC filings directly into our Cloud Storage solution. Obviously, this is not the end of it, since the data now only sits in the staging area. However, we have done exactly what we wanted to do in the start of this video. I hope you found this useful.